On to Module 9 now. Chapter 12, as I noted in Module 8, is broken into three modules, 8, 9, and 10. Chapter 12 is dense, and the ideas here need to be distilled, and we're taking three weeks to do that. Again, these small words carry a disproportionate weight. They cast a long shadow in terms of exegesis, in terms of preaching, and I trust that you're, you've seen that already in pronouns. And now on to prepositions. Uh, many grammarians state that participles and prepositions are the two most important parts of speech in New Testament exegesis. So let's give attention to module 9 here and looking at prepositions and prepositional phrases. Join me as we pray. Lord, I pray that you will minister to students again. I pray that you'll be gracious to them, give them strength and energy, margin, personal discipline time, and enrich them in your word. Refresh them even as I have enjoyed going through Colossians and thinking again about these prepositional phrases, the, the richness that they provide, the insight. I pray that you will help us to have balance with these, though. Even in the midst of the excitement, we recognize that in many places, prepositional phrases are not even used, where the same ideas of these prepositional phrases are carried by just a noun case. So help us to not make too much of the presence or absence of any prepositional phrase, but to explain well what you have said. I trust, Spirit, that you will do this for us. We ask in your Son's name. Amen. Even as I've prayed, you sense the, the way that we have to have moderation in exegesis, not making too much of any one part of speech, nor ignoring any part of speech. But we'll see today that prepositions, because there are so many instances of them in the New Testament, that we have to, again, recognize them for what they are, but not make too much of them. Let's think broadly about prepositional phrases then. They clarify the function of a substantive in a sentence, and that substantive can be a verb, it can be a noun, or the prepositional phrase, if it is preceded by normally the neuter plural article ta, can be a substantive itself and act as a noun in a sentence. Most prepositional phrases are adverbial. If you can find a verb that the prepositional phrase is modifying, then that's likely it. And how would you find that verb? By asking some questions about that prepositional phrase. Is it answering the question when or where or why or how? If it doesn't seem to modify a verb, look for a noun that it might modify. Does it say something about which or which kind of idea is being spoken about here? And you can see in 1 Timothy 6.3, Te kat you sebeon didaskalia. The teaching that promotes. It's that kind of teaching here that promotes godliness, caught eusebion, in terms of the standard of godliness and promoting it. It's that kind of teaching. It qualifies to that standard. Um, most adverbial, but if you can't find an, uh, a verb, then look for the noun that it might modify. One quick comment here just about this table before we go on to thinking about some of the proper prepositions. The ideas here, I trust you are finding uh, again and again in Greek. Ask questions of the text. Syntactical classification, identifying the way that a part of speech functions, is the result of asking questions. You have to interrogate the parts of speech in a text. Is it, is it, is it saying something about when or where or why or how? which, what kind of, and so forth. These proper prepositions are those that can be affixed to uh, a verb, and they can nuance or intensify uh, that idea. 
the improper prepositions are those that are not affixed to a verb. And we're looking at 17 here. I have a couple of columns that we'll notice here with ana and carry through the rest of the table. First, for many of these, I've placed the number of categories or definitions in BDAG. And Kostenberger, Merkel, and Plummer note this with uh, a P here and having 18 different designations. That's because BDAG places genitive, dative, accusative all together. And so I've just gone through for comparison on the prepositions preceding a P in alphabetical order here and provided you uh, here, for instance, N with, just occurs with the dative and there are 12 different definitions. Uh, ek occurs just with the genitive and there are six different. Uh, our textbook provides three out of 12. For ek, three out of six. Ace, three out of nine. So you can do the math. If we learn just these few here, we have several more we would need to look up or keep in mind, or just kind of have a stock of them, and we'll think about that as we progress. The other column, besides just the number of categories in BDAG, is the syntactical categorization, the logical categorization, if you will. And this is extremely important. Uh, Kostenberger, Merkel, and Plummer note these categories with each preposition they give examples of, and we must recognize that we need to know the simple definition or gloss of a preposition, but then we have to think about the categories that these definitions represent. Because here is where we have exegesis. It's not just enough to know translation. What do these translations mean? What are their possibilities? Each has the idea of a distribution of some kind. Spatial, upward. For ana. Ante, in place of, instead of, that's two of the five possibilities. And, and the categories are listed here. Substitution, cause, purpose. I have marked a paw and ek with arrows just as ace and n uh, because there is so much semantic overlap. Both a paw and ek deal just with the genitive case. Uh, 914 times in the New Testament, 646. Uh, so ek is used more frequently. But look at the glosses that are listed here, from, out of, from, and of. Generally, the distinction is ek has more of the idea of source and a paw of separation. But here we have just uh, two of the six major ideas. And the logical categories, a paw can be a temporal separation, a spatial separation, the sense of distribution, cause, agency. And one thing that will be helpful for you is to develop some kind of a mnemonic device, a word picture that helps you to think beyond just a couple of gloss definitions. But if you can think of a story or a word picture, that will help you uh, to think about the various possibilities. Uh, you could think of, uh, this is not original with me, but I've heard this illustration of a paw, your hand being a paw, and so you take something out of your pocket, your paw, a paw is out of, but it's also from your hand, so it's separating from your body. It's, it's a further separation. Perhaps you're taking something out of your pocket to distribute it to your your a family or to a friend. You're distributing something around to other people. Uh, maybe there's a cause involved. There's a certain need, so you're you're distributing it. You're, you're the agent distributing it, and you do this at a specific uh, time. From, from a point of time, you're, you're doing this. 
Perhaps you've come into some money and from that point on you're distributing. So some kind of a word picture. The more creative, the more personal it is, the more likely you are to remember it. And then these prepositions will move much more quickly. Dia, genitive and accusative, through, but there are five different nuances of the genitive and a couple for accusative. We think of, of agency, through or means, an intermediate means, or if it's a personal agent, uh, because can be a temporal idea as well. I noted ace and n and the overlap of, of ace and n. And what's interesting is the, the semantic overlap is extremely high, but they use different cases. Ace with the accusative and n with a dative can accomplish nearly the same purpose. Uh, n more frequent than ace, but we'll see in a moment here the, the way that these function into in of the nine different uses of ace can have a spatial designation inside of temporal uh, in a specific point or excuse me rather ace you know, in with the the dative here is in a temporal sense is a specific point of time ace is is more toward a, a point of time um, and, and a uh, duration of time as opposed to a specific point in time in as in n with a dative ace with the accusative then a spatial sense to or toward can have the idea of advantage and that's an important one for ace distinguishing it from n we recognize that there is a high degree of overlap but one of the features of ace that distinguishes it from n is an idea of advantage and disadvantage uh, sometimes result as well we've thought about ek already being source uh, out of and in here again point in time means uh, one distinguishing feature of n from ace is manner uh, the the manner in which something is done we've thought about a p already and the Genitive, dative, and accusative are overlapping in Bauer because there's so much uh, overlap in, in how they're used. Uh, spatially, temporally, cause, manner. So you're seeing that context plays such a large role here. Uh, again, think of, of some kind of a mnemonic device for these. Uh, mine for N, I think of Ben, N, Ben. A good first century Jew, uh, Ben is uh, at, at the synagogue, that's the space he is in. He's with his family, he has an association with them there. It's a point in time, it's on the Sabbath. He's there because of his ethnicity. He's, he's there by means uh, or, or instrumentation of the, the works that he's doing as a, a Jew identifying himself. These are his works that he does. And these works are the means of his righteousness, we might think. He's there in reference and respect to the traditions of his nationality as a descendant of Abraham. He's there in a, a manner of pride. He's a Jew. He's a descendant of Abraham. He's not a Gentile, an outsider, an unclean one. And he's there according to the standards of, of the law and honoring the Sabbath day. So I just have that mnemonic in my mind, and I can just pull that up when I see in and think about which category fits best. Noting here the overlap, not an entire overlap with kata and para, as with ace and n perhaps, but still some correspondence. Uh, genitive and accusative, genitive and accusative, para has the dative, kata doesn't, but you can see some of the logical categories that overlap. Kata, there's a standard involved, there's distribution, opposition, uh, para has opposition, uh, both have a spatial nuance to them. Para has uh, an idea of agency in the genitive that uh, may be distinguishing it uh, a bit. 
uh, but kata can have the idea of means at times in the genitive, so there is some, some overlap. Again, I've listed here the categories that surface in Kostenberger, Merkel, and Plummer, but uh, in, in Bauer as well. So if you haven't uh, familiarized yourself with Bauer as much as you would like to, here in Module 9 you have opportunity to do that. Keep in mind both the glosses of a preposition and the various logical categories that those glosses lead to because this is where exegesis happens in this column. This column is translation and possibilities and we want to think through those. I want to look with you at uh, accordance for just a moment here and I've pulled up one uh, feature that Bible software can accomplish uh, and just so helpful to see prepositions and yet we still have to read them. Here I've pulled up a paw and ek. Noted earlier that there is some semantic overlap between these two. Both take the genitive with direct object and then I've just put up an analysis graph so we can see a paw in red and ek in orange and just how they're distributed in Colossians. Uh, we could do the same with ace and n. So let me just pull up here. I'm going to search a lexical form and I type in ace. I want to make sure I don't get ace is one, but ace the preposition. And then I'm going to enter a command or And uh, again, the lexical form, ace and n. And then we can see the distribution here. Again, just in one click, what software can do. And this is, this is just so helpful for us to compare, to see patterns. N does occur more frequently than ace, N with the dative, ace with the accusative. Uh, but in Colossians, that's a much greater uh, a disproportionate uh, graph here. Uh, N uh, far dominates ace more than what is typical in the New Testament generally. But you'd want to compare epistles and <clears throat> we don't again don't want to make too much of these ideas but uh, note something of them. Uh, let's look at our uh, open book exercise. I want to note uh, a few of the prepositions here. You have uh, 50 to look at, uh, and of these 50, uh, as you progress through them, you will enjoy uh, just a couple of points each. I'm just going to scan through so you can see the, the full exercise. These are distributed throughout Colossians, so we're not just focusing on one uh, chapter, but throughout, and you'll look at each one. So a couple of points per, and I want to note a few of them with you here. Uh, again, a great exegetical exercise. Let's begin uh, in verse, uh, verse 6 here. To parantos es humas, kathos kai en ponti to cosmo esten, Carpa ruminon. Here we're again. We're talking about this word of truth, specifically the gospel that is, that is going out. Ace himos. Here we have ace in a spatial sense to you. It's just a spatial idea. So you want to put spatial here, as in ponti, and here in the the, the sphere, spatial sphere uh, within. One idea of in here is with uh, n and the, the dative, often you'll see in Colossians it's in the plural. The dative's in the plural. Here it's in the singular, and it's almost a distributive sense. In, in the distribution in, in, in all the world, in every part of the world, though it's, it's singular here, you want to try to think in, in those terms. It's pervasive. In with the dative in a uh, sphere, a spherical sense is often a pervasive kind of spatial or sphere 
idea. Kathos imothete apa epaphratu agapetu sundulu chemon, as you learned apa epaphra. Apa here is source or agency. Uh, Epaphras is the, the agent that the Colossians are learning from or have learned from. We go down to verse 9 here and we'll see apa again. Though the abbreviated form diatutakahimes apkes hemeras, here is a paw in a temporal sense from the day we heard of it. It's a temporal designation. U paumatha huper humon, we do not cease in behalf of you praying. Huper here in the sense of advantage, an advantage for the Colossians. Uh, let's jump down to verse 16. Hati en auto ectiste ta panta, because in him all was created, in toisu renois. Here again we have that spatial or spherical idea. And notice here with the plural, in the heavens, kai epites case, or spatial upon the earth. So both of these are spatial. And you'll notice that this is typical uh, with prepositions. There are different prepositions, a P with a genitive, N with a dative, and yet the same logical category. If we go later into chapter one, a couple of others to note. Uh, not to answer these in your open book exercise, but just notice uh, in verse 20 here, we have ta epites geis, ta entus tois urinois. These are substantival prepositions. Uh, again, most often adverbial, sometimes adjectival. Here, substantival with that neuter plural definite article before them. But further, notice the chiasm with verse 16. Ta epites geis, ta entois urinois is a reverse order from verse 16. In verse 16, it's heavens first and then earth, just a stylistic uh, uh, idea. Entois urinois, kai epites geis, but here epites geis first and then entois urinois, sort of bringing the whole of the him together. Let's go down to uh, verse 25 here of chapter 1. Kata. Ches egen amen ego diakonos, of which I became a minister. Kata ten oikonomion to theu ten dothesan moi, eis humas. Kata is a strong preposition. Uh, it's very forceful in, uh, when it has the idea here, especially of the accusative, in terms of a standard. And it uh, in with the dative can have a standard idea, but kata is a bit stronger. It's almost programmatic at times. And I think that's the case here. Kata with the standard, this administration of God that was given to Paul, this standard idea. I want to note here in chapter 2 uh, and verse 5, uh, or excuse me, verse, uh, verse 6 rather here and into 7. Notice how frequently we have uh, in throughout uh, this paragraph, here, here, uh, and down here, just in a string. We'll notice in a moment a text critical issue where N is supplied here after Beb by Umanoi. And uh, here's where we recognize that the dative in and of itself carries many of the categories that N with the dative carries. And we see the same with ek and the genitive, or a pa with the genitive. The genitive noun in and of itself carries some of these same ideas. And this is where we don't want to make too much of a preposition 
or its absence because here uh, we'll notice that it's supplied in uh, a manuscript and the idea is present because of the data even if n isn't isn't present so we'll notice that in a couple of moments but notice the the flexibility of n even here at the end of the paragraph verse 15 opek du somenos tas arkas kai tas exousios edegmatisen en parisia opek du somenos tas triumphing over here these rulers and authorities disarming them making a public display in Degmatisen in Parisia. Here this this manner is a public display triumphing over them again in Christ or in the cross. He is disarmed Apec du Samanos Tosarkos the rulers and the authorities making a display in Degmatisen and Parisia in a bold manner. Well, continue on to enjoy these prepositions, a delight to work through the C. Harris, uh, so many helpful comments that he provides. Want to note here this text critical issue I mentioned in chapter two and verse seven. Here this little bracket mark, en auto kai bebai umenoi, and someone might expect in te piste here with the prepositional phrase and the or the preposition in the dative to make a prepositional phrase uh, and we see in verse 7 that is supplied in te in sinaiticus and in vaticanus just the text uh, so let me note that here um, in uh, these manuscripts we've looked at. I've pulled up P46 first because Colossians 2.8 is at the bottom of a manuscript. And we're reminded that these manuscripts are fragile. And over time, many, if they were put in a jar, the bottom of the manuscript would erode or if any moisture would get in there. And uh, so we, we lack uh, the full uh, evidence here. And that's why you won't see P46 in the text critical note at uh, Colossians 2.7 that we are looking at here because uh, it is uh, missing here at the bottom of the manuscript. But we can look here in Vaticanus. En auto kai bebai u menoi te piste. Uh, there is no N, just te piste. But if we go to Sinaiticus, we can see that N naturally, it, it certainly could be included uh, in verse 7. Bebai u menoi en te piste. See the n right there? Uh, where uh, in Vaticanus it's not there, but you could easily see how a scribe would include this kind of a preposition, especially when you work through your open book exercise and notice how frequently n is used in Colossians. A few more vocab. I trust you're working on this. Again, you will not have your full uh, quiz on vocab for chapter 12 until module 10 in the next module, but continue uh, working on them. Lupe, grief, sorrow, moikuo, I commit adultery, nomizo, I think or suppose, say rhino, I dry up or wither, Coffin, from where? Oikumene, the inhabited world. Chamoi'o, a comparison. Udepate, 
adverb here. We'll think about adverbs in the, uh, the next module, module 10. Perisoteros, greater or more, play race, filled or complete. And with that, module 9 is filled here. Enjoy the work in Colossians and continue to update your full exegesis just as frequently as possible. There are many prepositions and prepositional phrases in, in Colossians. You don't need to classify everyone in your exegesis, but you'll want to, to keep working it through in a cumulative fashion. Enjoy.